They are elite athletes, idealized celebrities who have fallen from grace. Golfer Tiger Woods, cyclist Lance Armstrong, boxer Mike Tyson. What causes these individuals, who are at the top of their game usually, to participate in self-destructive activities? And what role, if any, does an adoring public play in their downfall? Weighing in with their thoughts, Jordan Peterson, professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. Michael Beckerman, president at Ariad Communications. Steve Mache, publisher and editor-in-chief of Sportsnet magazine. Cahal Kelly, columnist at the Toronto Star and Casey Hollins, host and writer for Sportsnet.ca. And it's good to have everybody around the table tonight for a discussion that is uh, always timely, sadly, because mm -hmm. this is always going on. Let's start this. I'm going to upset you all here by reading some of the competition. Here's Bruce, Ar Bruce Arthur writing in Post Media from just a couple of weeks ago. We keep getting reminded because we keep forgetting. On Thursday, Oscar Pistorius was charged with the murder of his 30-year-old girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp, in South Africa. He's accused of shooting her four times in the middle of the night in his home in Pretoria. The news comes as a shock. Murder charges should always come as a shock, but Oscar Pistorius is supposed to be a hero. It was incredible that this young boy had trained and persevered and become the first person to run in both the Paralympics and the Olympics. It was a story about human possibility, which is what sports is at its best. It's just that Oscar Pistorius, Blade Runner, wasn't the whole story. Sports is never the whole story. Lance Armstrong, coming back from testicular cancer to win seven Tour de France, was not the whole story. Joe Paterno, the learned coach who balanced college football and academics and morality in a way nobody else could, was not the whole story. Manti Teo's dead girlfriend wasn't the whole story. Nothing an athlete ever says or does is ever the whole story, any more than your job encapsulates the fullness of your life. Okay, let's get into this. You've interviewed lots of athletes in your day. Why do we worship these people? I think in large part we worship them because uh, they tap into childhood goals and, and aspirations, childhood dreams. And uh, as a result, these things, these dream lives that we, uh, we imagine for ourselves, we tend to, when we see someone perform well on the field, we tend to extrapolate that out and fill in the, bl the blanks in their personality and imagine that if they're as good as we would have liked to have imagined ourselves being on the field, that they'd be good. They're literally superheroes in every aspect of their lives. Hmm. It's not realistic, but that's what we bring to the table. Cahal, in, in, even as an ink-stained wretch, would mm -hmm. you acknowledge at some point along the way, you've probably found yourself admiring somebody a little too much for what they can do on the ice, on the pitch, on the field? Etc. Well, I think that you draw that distinction, and that's it. It is a dream factory, but you do not make moral judgments on them based on what they can do on the field. Mm -hmm. That's the writer. That's the writer who's with them all the time and perhaps sees a little bit of the off-the-record stuff. But because all we see them in is, is this perfect stage, right? We see them only on television. We see them only framed in the, the most heroic, ideal way. We tend to extrapolate that out, as Steve said, and think of them in that perfect milieu. Casey, is it wrong for us to worship these people? Um, it's not necessarily healthy, but it's just part of the celebrity culture in today's society, I think. They really are superhuman. Physically, they've got, mm -hmm. it's gotten to the point where athletes are superhuman. They do things we could never dream of doing, and it goes back to what Steve said. It's, we all played some sort of sport when we were younger, and, and to, you know, it's the ideal lifestyle. They're getting paid to play a game. And at this point, they're now like physical specimens that we could never, we could never do physically what they do. That's actually, Mike, if you think about it, 50 years ago or 75 years ago, we looked more like them. You can't say that anymore, can you? They really are different. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, none of us look like LeBron James, right? And you look right. what he's doing. Right. And it's, it's, a, it's a little bit uh, sad, too, because you see guys that don't look like us, whether it's a LeBron James or a Usain Bolt, and it's riddled with, geez, are, are they on the juice? Is there some sort of performance enhancing going on there? So in a way, the, uh, the, the dreams of the superhero has been taken away in this drug-tarnished uh, era. And the other thing, too, just in terms of the, the values of sport, I think one of the things is we want to think about, just because Tiger Woods is a phenomenal golfer doesn't necessarily mean he's a phenomenal person. But we equate the two. We do, let's put it this way. On first reflection, until we're given evidence not to, we tend to do that, don't you think? Yes, I, th I think we do, and we continue to make that mistake, right? Because there's the aspirational and there's the dream element associated with it. And it's part of all of us growing up and coming of age in a technological world where we're going to be a little bit more grounded in reality as we learn more truths as we go along. You want to That's pick up fact, on that well, notion of I, I, good athlete versus good sport? Well, I think you really put your finger on it when you said that 
we assume the perfection until proven otherwise. And whenever that happens, you see the activation of something that's deeply unconscious and also generally extremely useful. So I think what happens with, with our confusion with regards to sports heroes is that there's something about playing a game properly that actually really is worthy of hero worship. But playing a game properly, like everyone tells their 10-year-old, is not about winning. It's about playing in a manner, and here's a, it's a technical distinction. If you're a good sport, you play games in such a way that people invite you to play more games in the future. With honor. Well, that actually constitutes a kind of meta victory. Mm -hmm. You know, because a good, in life, a good sport is someone who goes from game to game, and there's games of all different types, and is popular and does extremely well at all of them. And when you tell your child, be a good sport, it's not about winning, what you mean is, never sacrifice your opportunity to play multiple games to the victory of any one game. Mm -hmm. And when we see someone play a game really well, we do unconsciously assume that they're not good athletes, they're good sports, and that's what makes them heroes. And then we have this disproved. I Steve. think that's a really good point, but I think that, that for us, the true ideal is the idea of somebody that can blend those two things together. The idea that you can be truly elite and outstanding and be a good sport at the same Fair time. Enough. And I think that a lot of times it says more about what we value as people than the athletes themselves that we tend to come at these things and fill in those blanks with the best possible interpretation of who they are. And my favorite example is Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan has legions of fans and the truth is the more you know about yeah. Michael Jordan, the, the more you know that he's really not a good sport at all. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who love Michael Jordan so much they resist that storyline at all costs. They don't want to hear it. And, uh, and I think that says more about us and what we're trying to get out of sports than it does about the athletes themselves. Maybe you can't win six championships if you're a good sport. Well, I would hate to think that that's true. And I think a lot of people would hate to think that that's true. We want to believe that it's possible. I, I, I think to compete at that very highest level, you need to have a sense of entitlement. Yeah. You can't go into the French Open and think, geez, I hope I do pretty well and make it to the semifinals. <laughs> I'm going to walk out of there yeah. with that trophy, right? right? And these guys and gals, they have their elbows up, and there's a sense of entitlement and expectation. Yeah. And, and you can only get there. That's kind of how we're warping things, too, I think, with regards to the hero worship, is that we put such incredibly high level of tangible reward on specific victories that it's really easy for the sportsmanship element to be completely subsumed. And it's, mm -hmm. and it's no wonder. So, but it's, it's definitely, it's a, it's a form of corruption of the entire enterprise. I mean, you see that in college sports particularly. Sure. Well, anybody who's spent any time around truly great athletes will tell you that the truly great ones are ruthless competitors. And certainly yeah. some can make the distinction off the field. They can switch that off. Very few can though. Most of them, everything they're competing at. These are the guys, the difference is, there are many people with the physical ability to do what they do. But what they're, the difference is that these are the ones that were so single-minded, so ruthless in their pursuit of this goal, Driven. they outstripped the ones who wanted a girlfriend in high school. They outstripped the ones that wanted to go to the dance. Yeah. These are the guys that stayed behind after class and shot a thousand jump shots. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who make it to the top. It, it really is impossible to accomplish those things without that mindset. I don't mm -hmm. think you can win six championships yeah. just having fun playing yes. basketball. It just doesn't yeah. happen that way. You are you have a different mindset than the people that you played with and that's you know that's how they get filtered out and that's how you get to the top stage you do have to go into the competition thinking not yeah this is going to be fun or i might win but i'm going to destroy the people that i am up against because that's mm -hmm. the only way to get to the top but we we have placed this high value mm -hmm. on winning like i have to destroy the competition so that i can win this trophy and or this money or this championship but that's part of our society has done that. Because when our team wins, we win. That's yes. what we think. Uh, we see ourselves in we're them. We're so tied into it. Yeah, exactly. We see ourselves in the individual athletes. We see our communities within the teams. And we're so invested in that that it, it means a great deal to us to see them succeed and to see them reach those high standards. Yeah. Michael. Well, can I just offer up, because I think it's a really good point in terms of uh, people's expectations and expecting to win. They're also surrounded by people that are a bunch of yes people for them, right? Mm -hmm. You've yeah. got your physiotherapist, yeah. you've got your yeah. sports doctor, you've got your dietitian, you've got your trainer, you've got your coach, yeah. and they're, you're in a bubble. Yeah. And if you start yeah. playing high-level golf when you're six years old or playing tennis when you're six years old and you're not going to the prom I and mean, you're not you're getting homeschooled and those types of things, and you're surrounded by people that tell you how fabulous you are, yes. all of a sudden those rules that you abide by on the basketball court or the tennis court 
don't necessarily apply to you as you start living your life outside the boundaries of sport. Let's go even beyond that. What's going on in the brain of somebody who's 23 years old, male, has just been paid $10 million a year, let's say, is living out of a suitcase almost all the time, meaning that they're meeting a fresh and steady stream of young women who are extraordinarily interested in them. You know, that's the premise. Go. So and we, can, and, and we expect imagine, nothing bad's going to happen, happen, right? You can imagine what's going through their mind. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't need a psychologist. One, yeah. one of the reasons, one of the reasons <laughs> that victory is so um, sought after by males in particular is that the correlation between victory in any given dominance hierarchy, so that's any given game, and sexual success for men is unbelievably high. So for women, it's, it's zero, just so you know. For men, it's like 0.7, which is one of the highest correlations that's ever been discovered between anything in the Sorry, social just sciences. Sorry, do that math again. What do you, what do you, zero and 0.7, what are you saying? Yeah, yeah. So the, your position in a dominance hierarchy, which is sort of like how much you are a victor of the game you're playing, mm -hmm. is by far the biggest determinant, if you're a male, of your sexual opportunities. So for women, the correlation doesn't exist at all. In fact, it's slightly negative. Hmm. So men are rewarded with access to women in an incredible manner by being successful at any given game. In a way that doesn't work for the, the other way around. Yeah. 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 Well, or uh, women's dominance hierarchies are different. That's another mm -hmm. way of looking at it, because they are. Steve, as long as we're all uh, on this, you know, um, there's all sorts of different trouble that athletes can get into. For Tiger, it was sex. Yeah. For Michael Vick, it was dogs. Uh, for Mike Tyson, it was sex. Um, you know, for Lance Armstrong, it was lying and being a bully and all of that other stuff. And tell, tell us why it is that when these guys fail, it is not just sort of a little failure. It is a spectacular meltdown in kind of everything that they previously represented. Well, I think it's really important. What you said at the top there is an important distinction to draw here. We're actually talking about a huge range here yeah. from cheating at your sport to infidelity to you know, doing drugs to murder mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Oscar Pistorius. So it's kind of dangerous to generalize about anything where the, the gap is that huge, point, I would yeah. argue. Mm -hmm. But that being said, it gets back to the point that we were just talking about. about you think about these guys in their childhood, okay? From the time they, they hit uh, puberty, they're identified as an elite athlete. You get into high school and you are encouraged to focus on your sport to the yeah. exclusion of everything else. Not then you just, get to college. Not just an elite athlete, an elite person. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. But in, in, mm -hmm. in athletics, it's particularly, you know, being on the honor roll doesn't quite come with the same well, level. They're told that they're just yeah, a they're wonderful person, not just athletes. Yeah. You're exactly mm -hmm. right. And so then you get to college and you're recruited heavily and you're babied all the way through college and then you sign your first contract and get a signing bonus. And it gets back to that point of spending your entire life with people kissing your backside. I think it has a profoundly negative impact on people. A lot of those regular knocks that we hit when we're, yes. you know, in high school or in our early 20s, things like hearing the word no, hearing yeah. you've got to wait your turn, yeah. hearing sorry you didn't get the job. These are all experiences that are formative for people and positive for people. Athletes, sometimes they, they get never hear very, this. very deep yes. in their life before they hit that wall at all. Hmm. And it can corrupt you. Jordan. Well, ever since the psychoanalysts we've sort of been convinced that you carry your sanity around in your head and you don't <laughs> you're saying if people can stand being around you mm. and then they tell you when you're an idiot if you're lucky <laughs> then you don't have to remember yeah. how to yeah. not be an idiot yeah. because people are smiling at you when you're interesting and frowning at you when you're not and so you outsource your sanity yeah. but if you're surrounded by people who are like uh, admiring you for self-interested reasons, you get no corrective feedback, and you're going to yeah. spiral out of control in your weakest spot. It is impossible to amplify enough how frictionless their worlds are. They really do nothing for themselves. I'm always reminded of this when I'm in a major league dressing room. It doesn't have to be any sport. You know, there'll be a hamper. They'll be undressing after the game, take off their underwear. The hamper is six feet away. They drop it right in front of them. Somebody scurries up to take their underwear and carry it that six feet to put it in the hamper. <laughs> they think about nothing except the goal. That's the definition they are, of entitlement. They are Spartans. They Although, have one function. Can I to play put a pitch game. in here, a little pitch in for hockey players who I think are probably 
more normal than most elite athletes? I think that's probably changing in the sense I don't want to denigrate. Certainly every sports writer has his hierarchy of <laughs> yeah. where he'd yeah. rather be. Well, CFL football players would yeah, be at the top. And that's absolutely right? but the most normal. They don't have frictionless worlds. These right. are guys that either came out of Canada and really had to struggle, or Americans who on some level, and I don't want to insult anyone, failed yeah. and at some point came down. So they And you always find this in any locker room. The guys that have really struggled, the journeyman, that's the guy you want to talk to. That's yeah. the thoughtful person. Mm -hmm. The star mm -hmm. has no awareness. They cannot explain to you anything about the game. They, what they do is completely natural. Mm -hmm. They have no focus. They have no inwardness. I'm going to ask you this question, Michael, because you don't buy newsprint by the barrel. No, I don't. Unlike some of the other Thank people you. here. There is often, when something bad happens to an elite athlete, a massive media pile-on, yeah. the likes of which is breathtaking. It's a feeding frenzy. Why does that happen, do you think? Oh, that's a very good question. I think, I think the relationship um, between the media, North American media and North American athletes is a little bit too cozy, is that the media has the resources to basically report on the game. And they don't have the resources to be truly investigative reporters. And I also think that there's a blurring of lines and that you've got to be somewhat polite because you want to get the quote from ex-athlete or whatever. So there's a... Uh, a, a, a truce, if you will, between the, ath the athletes and the media here in North America in particular. I think there's a fascinating parallel to Oscar Pistorius before this atrocious um, murder that happened. Um, well, alleged, alleged, we don't know that yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, somebody's dead. Somebody's, somebody's dead. dead. <laughs> Doesn't mean it was a murder. Homicide. Yes. Okay. Well, he's lucky I'm not the judge because I've got my, my point of view on that. But we look at what we did with Oscar Pistorius. The track and field community um, was not cheering for him to become part of the able-bodied Olympics because they thought he was unfairly advantaged with his, uh, with his blades. Mm -hmm. And then in the Paralympics, when he came in second, he didn't even shake the Brazilian guy who won, didn't acknowledge him. Poor sportsmanship, by the way. And, and his rationale was that the blades of the Brazilian athlete gave him an unfair advantage. <laughs> and so where was the journalistic integrity calling out at that time, you know what, Oscar Pistorius, he, he's got a chip on his shoulder, he's not a very nice man. Hmm. But yeah, we, yes, we there adore the stories yeah, along those lines yeah. at the time. Mm -hmm. I, and I take what you're saying, but the, the Pistorius ca case presents some interesting complications because I think we're engaged right now in a, a real uh, case of retroactive self-flagellation about, well, we should have seen this thing yeah. coming. You built him up. Well, we built him up, yep. but we built him up, I would still argue, for totally legitimate reasons. Oscar Pistorius was a case of overcoming enormous challenges. Mm -hmm. He was an inspiring story. He, uh, he did embody all kinds of values that you would want to pass along to your kids. And prior to all this coming out, the worst stuff we knew about Oscar Pistorius was that he liked to drive his car too, uh, too fast, that he occasionally drank too much, none of which really rose to the level of seeming particularly uh, grievous in any sense. And now that this horrible thing has happened, people are saying, well, where was the media to tell us that this guy was a potential murderer? <laughs> Nobody could have possibly known. Yes. history people of maybe violent relationships with previous well, the, women. Well, yes, there, okay, there's... There's allegations of domestic assault, yes. which came to the light a after the fact. But to making the leap then and to suggest that we should have been saying Oscar Pistorius was somebody who was, you know, a, a powder keg ready to go off, mm -hmm. I think is That's a bit much. A bit much. Jordan, it's also interesting to consider why we're so thrilled when something like this happens. And part of that mm -hmm. is, whenever you elevate something to the status of an ideal, it also becomes a judge, and the judgment says you're not the ideal. And so when the ideal falls, it's like it's a relief. And so mm -hmm. everybody has a little celebration. Mm -hmm. It's so, more than relief, though. It's big time schadenfreude. Yeah, everybody yeah sure. Everybody loves oh, to yes, pile absolutely, on. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You know, and that's... that's Human nature. Yeah, it's <laughs> when the pendulum swing swings too far one way, it tends to swing too far mm -hmm. back in, in, you know, when it tries to seek the middle. Can you come up with an example? I didn't set this up with you ahead of time, so this might be a bit unfair, but somebody who... You know, through your coverage, you thought, this guy's a pretty good egg, actually. I, I like oh, this guy. And then suddenly, you see that pendulum swing, and he actually turns out to be a miserable SOB. No, I don't think that's the case. Because I think if you spend a significant amount of time with someone, they show their colors to you. It may not bleed into your reporting on them. But certainly, you make these distinctions that you see it coming. There's certain guys that you see it coming. I think it's unfair to start. I mean, Roger Clemens is a famous one. Like, if you asked anybody who covered Roger Clemens, they despised him. Uh, I spent a lot of dealings with, not a lot of dealings, a few with Barry Bonds. Not a nice person, just <laughs> not a nice guy, yeah. even in those sort of private moments. But I, I draw this distinction. I don't know that the media can be blamed on this because from the sports reporter perspective, you are constantly trying to draw it back 
to sports. Mm -hmm. that, that really, that's your, that's your mandate, is mm -hmm. to bring it back to sports. It's the Nikes of the world who are drawing these people in hagiographical terms mm -hmm. in order to sell product. I think, is that not fair? Do you represent them? <laughs> I, 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 I spent 12 years there, yeah. you okay. instinct. <laughs> <laughs> Newspaper salesman. And I'll, I'll take it, I'll, I'll, I'll share a Michael Jordan anecdote. So 19, 1992 Olympics, show you how old I was. I was a kid there. Um, we had the dream team. It was Charles Barkley, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, and, when you and, say we, and Michael. America had the dream team. <laughs> America. Nike. Nike. Uh, the okay. Nike. Right. We, we, we had the dream team. Mm -hmm. And uh, Reebok was the uniform sponsor, yes. and so Michael Jordan said, well, Nike's been so good to me, I'm not going to stand on the podium with the, with the Reebok uniform on. And we said, Michael, that's not where we want you to take a stand. It's, you did a great thing, good for America, way to, win the, way to win the basketball gold medal. Go up there, be proud, we don't care whether you're wearing a, a Reebok logo on it or not. But that's what he wanted to take a stand on, and it wasn't important to Nike. And Nike got some flack on that. And in fairness, it, it, he draped the flag around him in such a way that you couldn't see the Reeboks that, that, that's, yeah. that's very fair, but he did yeah. that on his own. But my point is, we're telling Michael, there's more important causes that we yeah. want you to pursue than this. Mm -hmm. And it took a while for Michael to find his voice. Like, it took a lot of athletes to find their voice. And now he's very involved in the boys, boys and girls clubs of of America, right? It's the same thing with LeBron James three or four years ago. I'm going to take my talents to Miami. It took yeah. him a while to yeah. mature, yeah. and now he's doing a lot of great work in underprivileged areas for schools in the United States, too. So these guys evolve a little bit differently and at different paces. I would say, in fairness, if you think about the most famous sporting campaign of all time, which Nike produced, is Be Like Mike. Right. And this, I would argue, that no child expects to play like Mike. <laughs> they want to be like Mike. Mm -hmm. And you are setting up a situation in which people are thinking that he is a moral exemplar. Fair or not fair, but I think yeah. you're playing into those subconscious ideas. And so, yes. <laughs> so you have, you know, there is, and I understand there's a symbiosis between advertisers and the media that we want to amplify your messages because it makes these people more interesting. Well, they but, do sell newspapers, don't yes, they? Yes, so. absolutely. I think we're all involved in this moral continuum. Mm -hmm. I want to pick up on something you said a while back and go to Casey on this, and, I, I, and that is on the issue of gender. This is something. All of what we're talking about today is almost a uniquely male phenomenon. I'm not saying there are no women this doesn't happen to. Uh, you know, Marion Jones comes off the top of my head as a female Tony athlete. Harding. Sorry? Tonya Harding. Tonya Harding. Okay, so there's a couple. We could probably go along here, but it's overwhelmingly a male thing. And I wonder, do you ever sit around with your female colleagues in journalism and ask yourselves, well, what is with these guys? I don't, I, to me, it doesn't seem like much of a puzzle at all. There, think about it. There are no women that are idolized to this extreme. Mm -hmm. It's just plain out there are, there are none. You can't yeah, get to that. No, athletes, sorry, that's what I meant, yeah. athletes. You oh. can't get to that status without Nancy being. Nancy Kerrigan? Without Haley Wickenheiser, but it's not the same level, yes. and it's, it's just—it's just. I mean, Haley Wickenheiser, Wickenheiser, LeBron James. Like yes. You can't even compare okay. the two. I think it's very—it's actually very simple. It's just they're not idolized to that extreme. Do they cheat on their husbands? Yeah, I'm sure some of them do. Did Marion Jones use performance-enhancing drugs? She did. She apologized, which is something well, not a ton uh, of male athletes. Uh, hang on. After lying about it over and over she and over did, and over but, and over. But she had that press conference. People were eager to forgive her, and I've seen a lot of. Even now, a lot of apology press conferences that aren't, you know, that leave you wanting a little bit. And it takes, yeah. it takes a couple times. All you want to hear is them say, I screwed up. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she did that. And it just doesn't, they do do it. But they're not in the public eye. They don't have reporters following them around at their, the same way that males mm -hmm. do. I think it's really that simple. I guess tennis would be the one place the one sport where women much. have as high a profile as yes. men. I would, that's, I but think even then, the female tennis players' behavior is not as bad as male tennis players' I, As someone who's covered a little tennis, uh, unbelievable. I'll always go to it. It's got nothing to do with the sports because the athletes are so charming. Mm -hmm. They're so giving of their time. They're so open. They're so mm -hmm. unaffected. The men? Why, not quite why the, is that? I have no idea why. I mean, <laughs> tennis just, has always put a lot of emphasis on sportsmanship and politeness and so on. But so you don't I find the same. I, I, Steve, I, you know, you back me up on this. I don't know. I, I find with the males it's not quite the same. It's the, You get that same sort of big league attitude. If they're big league, yeah. you're sort of back. Women don't have those buffers mm -hmm. for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. I would agree. And interestingly, tennis about 10 years ago made a conscious decision to start pushing the women's game as hard yeah. as they did the men. They brought uh, prize money more into, uh, into equality and that sort mm -hmm. of thing and consciously focused on promoting the stars. And maybe that's not coincidental that Serena Williams is probably the one star who comes to mind that might yes. be on that A-level with yeah. a lot of the other men. And she's also had her 
moments where she's maybe not been so nice. Absolutely. But again, no. we're quick to forget and quick to move on from that. And I think, you know, she's quick to say sorry and, and move on, and it, she hasn't made a habit of it. Right. Well, <laughs> bad, bad men are often much worse than bad women, or bad women are more subtle. That might be another way of thinking. Bad well, women are more subtle. What is, yeah, what do you well, mean? you know, girls bully, for example, but it's more subtle, it's more verbal, and so on. And it's not, <laughs> men are pretty aggressive, and most of the people in prison are men. And so when men go bad, violent and aggressive things tend to happen. And so, you know, that also makes the sports world more spectacular in that way. And men are bigger and they're stronger. And when but, they do bad things, they use weapons. But let's not even consider the, uh, the violence of this. Let's just consider judgment. I mean, Michael Vick with, I involved in the torturing of dogs. Uh, you can give any number of other examples where it's not a question of violence. It's just a question of questionable judgment. Uh, Kobe Bryant, questionable judgment. Michael Jordan betting on games and whatever else, or I don't know, gambling debts and this kind of thing. Questionable judgment. This is a male phenomenon. How come? I don't think that the oh, stakes, I like the pause. Are, stakes yeah. are higher, maybe, for men. Yeah. You know? Casey? Well, I just don't think that the questionable judgment part is a male phenomenon. I think we just don't hear about it when it happens to females. There aren't as many to talk about, and we don't talk about them as often. So the women they, are doing equally dumb things out there, we just don't know so much about it? Not necessarily. I mean, they're not, like I said, it all comes back to the very beginning. They're not built up the same way, so they don't have the same sense of entitlement. They don't have the same resources. They don't have the same lifestyles. Mm -hmm. I think it comes down to all of those things as well. Michael. Uh, I, I think the uh, uh, adrenaline rush, like I think gambling's interesting, actually, because uh, uh, there's been a fair amount of high-profile athletes that have lost a, a lot of money in Las Vegas, right? Mm -hmm. And you talk to the athletes, and it's the adrenaline rush. Yes. They've retired. They've spent yes. 22 years loving the sport and, and shooting the buzzer beater. And where do you get that adrenaline run, rush again? Inexcusably, maybe you get it through gambling, you get it through drinking, you get it through chasing women, what have you. Hmm. So I think they're trying to recreate the mindset of their playing days. Right. And one of the char common character traits is risk takers. That's mm -hmm. what these people, these are not by their nature conservative people. Again, that's where you're shedding at the high school level the guys who ha maybe have the physical talent but can't make it to the top level. These are the guys who are ruthless risk takers. Mm -hmm. I don't want to push this if it's not here, but, but I am curious. Steve, is there any part of you that feels at all sorry for, let's say, a guy like Tiger Woods who spends his entire life, and in his case, it was his whole life. I mean, he had a yeah. golf club in his hands from the time he was two. Yeah. So he's at it for 30 years or 35 years or whatever, and then sure. suddenly all the secrets come out, and in an instant, uh, loss of respect, loss yeah. of opportunities, loss of his sponsors, it all disappears in a, yeah. in a night. I th there, there absolutely is for me. Tiger Woods isn't the greatest example from my perspective. What's a better but, example? Uh, Ryan Friel. Okay, here's a guy who made it to the major leagues and uh, got his, uh, his cup of coffee, had about a five-year uh, major league career, then suffered an injury and uh, within a year and a half was out of the game, uh, kicked around, struggled, saw his ma marriage uh, fall apart and killed himself um, about six months ago. Okay, so here's an example of somebody... Uh, that's not self-destructive behavior that caused all that. Though. There, there was, I'm glossing over a lot of the details. Oh, okay. But the point here is that I think that uh, the life of a pro athlete is, in fact, much more difficult than most people imagine. Most of us sit around and we think, you know, all I need is one million bucks and one good season <laughs> and I can make that last forever. Yes. We all feel that way. The truth <laughs> of the matter is it's far, far more difficult. People can't appreciate the level of stress, the level of temptation. And when you combine that with the lack of formative experiences that give you the, those, those, those instincts to deal with extreme situations in your life, these guys are not particularly well armed for adulthood, mm -hmm. much less an extremely stressful adulthood where you're constantly reminded of the enormous stakes that you're facing and, and the need to perform on the field. And that makes everything else outside of the field go away. If you are performing well on the field, all your other problems will go away. Well, it's a lot harder, and for those guys, I do feel. Jordan. Well, I also think this is sort of a Nietzschean take on the situation. Um, Nietzsche said that most morality was cowardice, by which he meant that people didn't do bad things often because they were afraid to, not because they thought it was wrong. But here's why I'm saying that. Most men aren't tempted by boatloads of beautiful women. So they can say, well, you know, I'm faithful. It's like, yeah, maybe you are, but maybe no one wants to sleep with you. And then, and the, really, and you know, you never tested on that, really. Whereas the, like the athlete in his prime, it's like, you really think you wouldn't succumb to those temptations? Or, and then again, you might think, well, shouldn't you, if you're young? I mean, maybe the answer is no, but it's by no means obvious. And it's certainly by no means obvious that most men would pass that test. 
So, any well, you mentioned fear, and these athletes aren't afraid of much. They're not scared something bad is going to happen yes, if they get right. caught cheating. They're not scared something bad is going to happen if they take right. that drug. Because why would it? Well, they're also their life not scared. Yeah. Th their life experience says nothing bad is ever going to happen to them. And their, and their bubble of supporters have protected yes. them for so long as well. Yes. Like, like, think about how poorly Lance Armstrong read the public mood yes. before he went on Oprah and he Absolutely. posted that picture on Twitter of him underneath uh, his uh, Tour de France jerseys. And then he went on to Oprah and he didn't really apologize. No. There was no empathy. He couldn't no. keep track of how many people he, he uh, took to court on that. So I think the answer to your question, to feel badly for them, I think it goes case by case. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, Marion Jones, after she got caught, yeah, she started to feel bad, and right? Sent to prison. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the, and the and other, other, prison, ad, right. other athletes that. that want to take some leadership and take some ownership and take some accountability. I think those are some people I feel empathy for. Let me for. pick up on the marriage comments, though, that you just made. Tiger Woods, when his drama played out, he lost his marriage, mm -hmm. right? He, he lost the right to live with his own children when that happened. Uh, Kobe Bryant, um, I think it cost him an enormous amount of money in a new piece of jewelry for his <laughs> wife before he could return to that home. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of examples out there of how there is a price to pay, big or small, financial or not, if you do this as an athlete. Well, there is. They're just not aware of it at the time. They're not thinking about that in the normal, in the normal everyday marriage type sense. They, their marriage isn't like other marriages and they didn't enter it thinking that. They just, they don't fear the consequences because in their life there hasn't been many. Now let's come out the other side. Often when these terrible falls from grace happen, they hire people like you to come in and um, give them advice on how to resurrect their good image. And that's irresistible to the public too, isn't it? We love the story of redemption mm -hmm. and the trip back up, right? Um, yeah, sure we do. And I think what I would say in terms of ad advice that I, my clients would come to me, not so much for public relations advice, but in terms of redemption, you've got to be so very careful in terms of the athletes that you're associating yourself with. Nike knows athletes inside and out, guessed wrong on Lance Armstrong, right? Nike knows athletes inside and out, guessed wrong on Tiger Woods. What I would recommend to, uh, to clients is, yeah, sure you want to associate yourself with people with shared values. Make sure it's within the context of um, the sport in which we're really good at, right? Like Nike could get away with supporting Tiger Woods on the golf course, but not outside the golf course. And so that was Nike's point of view on that. Hmm. I think one of the things that we're talking about, all these high profile people that have flamed out, there are some phenomenal people doing some great things in amateur sport. That are doing it for the love of the sport. Yep. And they're trying to represent their, their own individual goals, their mm -hmm. town, their country, or whatever. And their motivations and goals are, are fabulous. I think what's going to happen is we're going to see a lot of marketing dollars that have gone to these high-profile athletes go to amateur sports and back to grassroots sports as well. It's a bit, little bit safer um, an environment for sponsors and also an easier way to reflect your brand values back. I think that's that risk, though. Oscar Pistorius was an amateur, That's and true. the uh, and more and more as that as the lens shifts to amateur athletes, the stakes will go up as well. The yeah. potential for endorsements, the potential for temptation, which leads you right down the same uh, path. I feel like the the ultimate lesson is if the best moral and ethical advice you're getting is coming from your agent, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, Tiger Woods is playing golf again and never has to answer any questions about his private life anymore because no one dares ask him anymore. No. And if you look at other, Michael Vick got a yes. starting quarterback job in the NFL after the whole dog fiasco happened. Back to making millions well, of bucks again. Well, in fairness, again. these are people in front of the microphones every day. How many times can you ask the same question once it's been answered? I, I draw a distinction. There's two types of redemptions. There's Kobe Bryant-type redemption, and there's Lance Armstrong's failed redemption. Kobe Bryant redeemed himself entirely through sport. Mm -hmm. He never said sorry. But he did, he made his, his fall came early enough in his career that he could simply play his way back into the esteem of the American public. Lance Armstrong, to his enormous misfortune, can no longer cycle mm -hmm. and therefore needs to come out and apologize and is incapable of doing it. If Lance Armstrong had been caught after his second Tour de France and then won five more, I guarantee you no apology would have been required. Absolutely. Hmm. That's exactly right. And the Lance Armstrong thing, for me at least, is also complicated by the fact that you've got, you've got multiple offenses here in my, in my view. There's the cheating. Yeah. I could have forgiven the cheating. You know what I mean? There, then there's the lying. 
can even forgive the, yeah. the lying, probably. It's the fact that he aggressively went out and tried to ruin yes. the lives yeah. of people who told right. the truth. Yeah, and that, that, to me, gets right at somebody's character yeah. that is really difficult. That's why it would be very difficult for me to buy into any sort of redemption story for Lance. Well, he's so scared that he's going to lose his job, he's gone after other people's mm -hmm. jobs. That's the narcissism turns into malevolence. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly, and that's, that's why How a lot of people... How do you come back from can't. that one, Michael? Well, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting point, and it's where we started from the beginning, mm -hmm. right? You can have great respect for these people as athletes. You don't mm -hmm. necessarily need to respect them as human beings. Mm -hmm. right. And I think whether we're sponsors or we're media or we're parents, it's a reminder of, hey, that guy, guy or gal might be a great golfer. It doesn't necessarily make them a human being. Mm -hmm. And there's some really good human beings out there. I've got to tell you, I respect all of you as human beings. Thanks for this conversation today. This was great. Let's thank Michael Beckerman, president of Ariad Communications, Steve Mache, editor-in-chief, Sportsnet Magazine, Cahal Kelly, columnist at the Toronto Star, Casey Hollins, host and writer for Sportsnet.ca, and Jordan Peterson, the professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, who will be back with us tomorrow night, I gather. We will look forward to seeing your pleasant face for another <laughs> evening thank here you. in our studios at Young and Eglinton. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.